Hello, I'm Pete Liggett. I'm a principal consultant with Mercer Government's clinical and behavioral health solutions sector and a practicing clinical psychologist. Prior to joining Mercer, I served as South Carolina Medicaid's Deputy Director for Behavioral Health and Long-Term Living. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on building a comprehensive behavioral health crisis system. Since 2020, we've seen federal legislation and a nationwide investment in states to develop comprehensive behavioral health crisis systems that can immediately intervene, provide treatment, care, and support for individuals experiencing a behavioral crisis. This summer, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or 1-800-273-TALK, will become 988 nationally. This means that wherever a person is in the United States, they can dial 988, similar to 911, and be immediately connected to a local suicide prevention and crisis call center that can address a person's needs and coordinate care in real time. By dialing 988, individuals will be connected to a behavioral health crisis worker completely separate from law enforcement and public safety. Today, we're gonna to talk about 988, but also what comes after 988, focusing on how states can substantially and sustainably build comprehensive behavioral health crisis systems so that 988 is integrated into the existing care continuum and individuals in need can be connected to ongoing care and services that support wellness and recovery. Joining me is Mercer government's Alexandra Herrera. Prior to joining Mercer, she was Arizona Medicaid's crisis system director and is a national subject matter expert on behavioral health crisis systems. Thanks for joining me, Alex. Pete, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So let's start with you talking about what happens when someone calls 988. Absolutely. So your call will be answered by a real live person, a crisis professional who likely lives in your local community and knows about the community resources and supports that are available. They will help you or a loved one find strategies and immediate solutions to address the precipitating crisis and get, and get you connected to care to support your ongoing needs. In data from my own state of Arizona, we know that crisis call centers are able to immediately address the needs of callers around 80% of the time over the phone. That means that 80% of folks who called in likely didn't need to go to the hospital, likely didn't need to engage with public safety, and had an opportunity to address their needs within their own community in real time. That's impressive. Can you talk about the individuals, though, that need further support beyond the call? Yeah, so the call center will have established clinical and safety protocols that they will follow. If they determine over the course of the call that you need additional support, one option is to send mobile crisis teams to your home or to wherever you are in the community. Some models may use telehealth instead of in-person response, but in many cases, a team of trained individuals will respond directly. This may include a behavioral health professional, a peer, or other members who will provide immediate stabilization, screening, de-escalation, and safety planning. Ideally, this team would respond quickly, so within an hour of your initial call to 98, and this service would be available statewide and around the clock, 365 days a year, and not just available in urban and populated areas. Again, data from my own state in Arizona, we know that when a mobile team responds in the community, they're able to address the needs of that individual then and there around 70% of the time. Okay, so same question again. What happens with the remaining 30% of the individuals who need even more support? Yeah, another great question. So it largely depends on the services available in your community. Mobile crisis responders will do everything that they can to resolve the crisis in situ and not transport you to a hospital, an emergency department, or call 911 unless it's absolutely necessary. In fact, in Arizona, less than 1% of folks who engage with a crisis system are directed to 911. The goal is that the crisis system be capable of addressing the majority of client needs. So as part of crisis care continuum building, it's important to have a place to go for folks who need the most help. There has been a lot of success in my state and nationally with crisis stabilization centers. These are short-term facilities. They're sometimes attached to hospitals, but it's important to know they're not hospitals or emergency departments. 
I kind of see them as like akin to a behavioral health urgent care center. So these are places where behavioral health clinicians, case managers, peers, and nurses will work together to help triage and address your behavioral health needs and can also address some simple physical health needs like wound care, for example. Also, in some cases, these facilities have dedicated law enforcement drop-off services. So if someone is displaying behavioral health symptoms in the community and they've engaged with police, law enforcement has the option to take them to get immediate treatment rather than booking them into jail. It's important to know the answer isn't always facility-based stabilization models. Maybe it's facility-based stabilization in conjunction with other areas like expanded in-home supports and community-based stabilization. That's been a model, particularly on the children's side, that's been promising. Um, it could be expanded respite options and opportunities, including crisis respite for caregivers, access to safe and sustainable housing, temporary housing and shelters is another big example. And then of course, ensuring a sufficient network and access to behavioral health and substance use disorder practitioners including access to detox and MAT services. So crisis stabilization facilities are important, but they shouldn't be the only option within the crisis care continuum. Well, that's a great explanation, Alex. Uh, I really appreciate that. Talk now a little bit about the importance of follow-up for an individual who, who's received crisis intervention services at any of the levels. Yeah, so follow-up is extremely important. If you or family member have experience with mental health or substance use disorders, then you know how crucial personal engagement is for families, for individuals and families who engage with behavioral health treatment, especially if that engagement and follow-up comes from a peer or someone who's walked a similar road as you. Best practice dictates that individuals who engage with crisis services should receive a follow-up call almost immediately or at least within 48 hours of their initial engagement, depending on their acuity. Sometimes that could also include an in-person visit to ensure your continued stability. This can happen immediately, it can happen within the first weeks, and in some cases it can, it can happen ongoing for several months, depending on what services are available locally. Follow-up should be initiated by your last point of engagement with the system, and this should be well-defined to avoid what I like to call member harassment, you know those calls where multiple people from different places are calling you and asking you the same thing over and over. Um, so as an example, if you call 988, a mobile team dispatches to your home and they transport you to a facility. It's incumbent on the facility and the facility alone to follow up with the member directly. Um, and even better if it's a peer or, or, the, or the treatment team who you engaged with while you were at that facility. Another big piece um, is access to member information and integrated data systems. So for example, if that, if that member is already receiving treatment, they might have a care team, maybe a case manager or a care, care coordinator, um, or even a primary care provider, there should be practices to ensure that your treating providers are notified, not only at the, at the point of engagement with a crisis system, um, but they should also be notified on the outcomes and next steps um, that were identified as part of your safety plan. And this should happen in real time. Well, Alex, you've certainly made a case for states having a well-developed crisis service array. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little about what some of the challenges are that states face in getting to that, uh, achieving that, that goal. Well, Pete, I'm glad I've convinced you. So some of the big challenges are you know, this is new to many states. There just simply isn't the existing infrastructure and it's being built right now from scratch. Some states do have partial infrastructure, but the services aren't coordinated and the services can vary across regions, counties, sometimes within, you know, within, within cities. Um, some states might have elements of each of the crisis service, but they don't have a complete continuum and they aren't integrated and they don't work together. Also, those systems may not be embedded within the behavioral health or care continuum. Timing. I can't stress this enough. 98 is happening. 98 is coming this summer. And frankly, the infrastructure hasn't been developed yet for what happens after somebody calls into to the crisis line, specifically for mobile crisis intervention services and facility-based crisis stabilization. Workforce. 
a huge issue. Uh, the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated um, a pre-existing shortage of trained behavioral health professionals and paraprofessionals. There just simply isn't the workforce to support the expansion of behavioral health services and states need to be creative to find solutions. We've done a lot of work with our clients to support and ensure a sufficient behavioral health workforce. And then finally, some might say this is the biggest one, but of course the money. Um, much of the funding so far has been concentrated on developing 988 infrastructure only. There has been some recent movement to support other aspects of the crisis continuum, but frankly, it's too soon to determine if it's enough and if that support will be consistently available long-term. Well, you've outlined the challenges really nicely and brought us to the place that most policymakers find themselves, and that is, how do we pay for this? Yeah, so that's, that's the big question, especially with the idea that crisis services be available to everyone, irrespective of your insurance status and your ability to pay. So states are in the position where they have to leverage multiple funding streams to provide these services to all individuals around the clock. Today, support is provided primarily via Medicaid for Medicaid eligible members, SAMHSA mental health block grant dollars, and state dollars, primarily Olmstead settlement money um, and other state dollars to support the uninsured. Um, recently in 2021, uh, with the passage of the American Rescue Plan, CMS has set minimal standards and they've temporarily incentivized states um, with an enhanced FMAP to provide mobile crisis services to Medicaid eligible members. In 2020, the National Suicide Designation Act was signed, and that did create an opportunity for states to introduce a small telecommunications fee on wireless phones to fund 988 call centers, similar to how 911 is funded. A handful of states um, have pursued this option successfully. There's a few more that are in progress. However, it's not likely to be a realistic solution for some states. Private payers, commercial insurances, and Medicare have been slower, and in some cases are just simply not supporting reimbursement for crisis intervention services. So I would say that there's substantial opportunities for work in this area. And then the question becomes really how we leverage those, these multiple funding streams to ensure that services are available for anyone, wherever they are, and finally, what's the state's role and which entities within the state are responsible for the development and sustainability of these systems? So Pete, we've talked a lot today and I wanted to share some final parting thoughts. We've thought of mental health disorders as separate and distinct from physical health conditions for too long. We have robust emergency care systems to address physical health needs but we've only just begun the work to develop behavioral health emergency care systems. This is the beginning. There's a mountain of work to be done, but this work will undoubtedly save lives and help people get the care and support they need to live healthy lives. Well said, Alex. You're absolutely right. We've got to remember the people that we serve in this work. I want to thank you for taking time for this discussion today, Alex. I want to thank you all for listening to our discussion on Beyond 988, Building a Comprehensive Behavioral Health Crisis System. We've provided additional resources and links posted with this video.